Welcome to the Archive of Nations, home of the custodians of the sacred records from time immemorial. Please subscribe and press the notification button as we have many lessons to educate and empower with a correct narrative of the past to create a lawful blueprint for the future. Welcome to Webisode 19 entitled Pigmentation of the Ancient Egyptians, Melanin Test by Chai Kanta Diop. In the previous webisode, we took a look at the great foundation on ancient Egypt set by the great ancestor Chaik Antadiop and Theophil Obenga at the UNESCO Symposium of 1974 in Cairo and the body of evidence provided. The reason for this series artisans, scholars, and warriors is to present the flowers for those who sought liberation of carbon organic peoples the world over, often with the sacrificing of their careers or ultimately their very lives. There are a great number of YouTube content creators which are now taking this information to another level for a new generation. Our overstanding as the carbon organic civilizers of all other races and the founders of civilization lays in the truth that the carbon organic genome and foundation of life lies in the molecule referred to as melanin which Chai Kanta Diop studied in depth back in the 1960s and 70s. This webisode focuses on the work found in the Bulletin of the Fundamental Institute of Black Africa Series B, Human Sciences, Volume XXXV No. 3, July 1973, entitled Pigmentation of the Ancient Egyptians, The Melanin Test by Chai Kanta Diop. We have extracted from the Bulletin the general aspects Chai Kanta Diop was seeking to convey, and we will discuss further in our Science of Creation series exclusive to the Archive of Nations. The following webisode is intended to show what the ancestor Chai Kanta Diop uncovered and his processes beginning with the general overview that in his own words states, 1. The level of melanin is a fundamental racial characteristic and 2. That this rate can very well be measured in practice by various methods in the laboratory for all races and for living or dead beings. We then applied the method to a few Egyptian mummies preserved in the Anthropological Laboratory of the Musée de l'Homme in Paris, thanks to the kindness of Mrs. Kamla, head of the department, and her aides. We used the technique of thin sections observed in ultraviolet or natural light. The preparations were graciously prepared by Mrs. J. Guillen, a technician in the Physiology Laboratory of the Faculty of Sciences of Dakar and Mr. Mamadou Sisse, in charge of the IFAN Vertebrate Department. The results speak for themselves. First of all, contrary to widespread opinion, mummification processes do not destroy the epidermis to the point of rendering the method inapplicable in most cases. In particular, it would make it possible to analyze the skin of all the royal mummies of the Cairo Museum in perfect state of preservation. Thutmose III, founder of the 18th dynasty, the conqueror of all Western Asia, Seti I, the founder of the 21st dynasty, and his son, the famous Ramesses II. The game would be worth the candle, and that's why I tried to get samples to analyze. The curator of the Cairo Museum, Dr. Riyadh, had promised to send me samples, but I have been waiting for more than a year. I am surprised, however, that such an analysis has not already been attempted and carried out by other researchers for a very long time. In any case, we can say that such an examination undoubtedly reveals an unknown melanin level in Lucaderm races and undoubtedly classifies ancient Egyptians among Africans of Black Africa. Let us make some general remarks before discussing the purely technical exposition of the method. It should be noted at the outset that even today's Egyptians, after so many millennia of crossbreeding, still belong to the blood group B of the Negroes of West Africa, except Group A the present inhabitants of the Delta region that have obviously come from elsewhere. Since the blood groups of the last prehistory men can in some cases be determined from their skeletons and the remains of their mummies, there is a possibility of studying migration. The blood group A is of importance to anthropology. It is characteristic of whites of European origin and is not found in principle in colored races and Negroes in particular. The Gloger rule states that in warm-blooded higher animals, the melanin pigmentation tends to grow with heat and humidity. A high degree of moisture combined with a high degree of heat causes black pigmentation. The maximum pigmentation being in the warm regions of the equator and the minimum at the Arctic Circle. The same scale seems to be valid for man. On the other hand, the triumph of the thesis of the monogenetic origin of mankind obliges us to reconsider all ethnic problems from a new angle. 
And drawing all the consequences of this fact, it must be admitted that all other races are born of the Negro race perhaps from a differentiation of the man from Grimaldi in Europe. The present laws of heredity would not oppose it. Quantum chemistry even attempts to formulate the law of biological mutations, or in any case to give a satisfactory scientific explanation. The Grimaldi would have passed through Gibraltar and Spain as the man of the Acheulean would have done. Another fairly probable parallel route would be through Tunisia, Sicily, and southern Italy. A humanity born under the latitude of the Great Lakes must, according to what follows, be pigmented in black on the functional role of pigmentation, and according to the rule of Gloger. If this hypothesis is to be taken into account, and it is difficult to see how the present state of scientific research could be escaped, the picture of the evolution of the human species would be as follows, a strongly pigmented negroid homo sapiens, Gloger's law, would have moved from the Great Lakes region, Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, to populate the rest of the world by migration. For Dr. Lakey, not only Homo Faber, but Homo sapiens sapiens was also born in Black Africa at least 150,000 years ago. We believe that this man would have gained Europe, not by the Suez Isthmus and the periphery of the Eastern Mediterranean where his traces are non-existent, but by the Sahara, Spain, or Italy, which gives a singular importance. The rock paintings that mark this voice and, it must be said, raises problems of chronology. But they are in the process of finding a scientific solution. In fact, they were the consequence of a sort of curse which the eminent French scholar Vaufry had thrown upon Africa without making it on purpose. Africa is lagging behind, he had written, from then on. It became a sacrilege to attribute an age of any age to anything in black Africa. Nothing here could be connected chronologically to anything in Europe. But here is the advent of absolute chronology, potassium argon, C14, etc., which restores the rights of science against the prejudices of scientists. Hence the triumph of the monogenetic origin of man with localization the cradle of humanity in Africa. It was the potassium argon method and related methods that made this feat possible. It is even known that men probably of the species sapiens exploited the oldest mine in the world 40,000 years ago in Swaziland to extract red ochre. But leaving the latter aside to return to that of the Homo sapiens of Kenya, their antiquity, they are anterior Grimaldi and the man of Kunkapil makes plausible the idea of a migration to Europe from Homo sapiens negroids, the Grimaldian in this case, and the Upper Paleolithic. The prehistoric African facts could very well explain those of Spain and the south of France, all prejudice apart. Two difficulties would remain, a. The Saharan chronology should one day provide dates for the Upper Paleolithic and not only for the Neolithic in particular with regard to rock art, it may be assumed that a more detailed, more thorough and methodical study of the facts could also change our thinking on this serious issue. B. The difficulty that prehistoric man would experience in crossing the Straits of Gibraltar. In the 7th Congress of Prehistory, Addis Ababa, 1971, the typologist, Tixir spoke of the nervousness of the lower Paleolithic specialists whenever they contemplate the implications of the presence of the poultry, this typically African industry, in the south of Europe, excluding the northern regions. In fact, the idea is that in the remote period of the lower Paleolithic, Homo Faber, the man of Acheulean was already sufficiently equipped to cross the Straits of Gibraltar, much less. Grimaldi's man of the Paleolithic era could have carried out such a feat if such was the path followed, how to explain racial differentiation, in the present case the appearance of white or Cro-Magnon man 20,000 years ago in the Salutrian, that is to say 10,000 years after the arrival of the Negroid Grimaldi in Europe. The problem is posed, science will answer it, but science is scientifically merited to our mind with the triumph of the monogenetic thesis. The account that we have given of the colloquium on the appearance of Homo sapiens and the ideas which could be put forward prudently on this question concerning the probability of mutations with a change of environment. The Grimaldi, who is in any case an invading Negroid, is the first occupant of European soil as Homo sapiens sapiens and the first white appeared 10,000 years after his arrival. We may assume a mutation due to the change in physical, climatic conditions in particular, for we are in full glacial period and Negroes or Negroids, transplanted under such conditions for such a period of time, may well change in appearance. 
the distinctly Negroid characters of the Cro-Magnon of Spain, the Nigritic osteology of the first Cro-Magnon man of France, the late appearance of this white, the still later one of yellow, the man of Chancellade, to the Magdalenian 15,000 years ago, so many facts that did not receive a rational explanation become more intelligible to us in the light of this hypothesis. Western scholars have already expressed similar ideas. This is the case of Sandforch quoting Gori. On the other hand, the Paleolithic works of art clearly situate the peak of the civilization of this remote state in Western Europe, especially in the Aquitano-Cantabrian region. Manifestated from the Auric Nation as one of the first creations of the Homo sapiens, art develops in Solutrine to magnificently flourish in the Magdalenian. During this long period, it is still the West that is the initiator, or at least the transmitter of a civilization coming perhaps from the South, that is to say from Northwestern region. This is what Professor Gori thinks, a civilization stemming from the African land, that would upset the principles so far. The classical tradition has never ceased to affirm that all ancient civilizations come from the East. We are so impregnated with traditions erected in dogmas that an African civilizational nucleus seems incomprehensible to us. What we are able to affirm is that the first current of people to whom we owe our lower origination comes from Africa by Spain, and no doubt also by Italy. Be that as it may, one sees that the moment is not far when the learned world will admit that the black race is the first race of Homo sapiens to exist, all the others are derived from it by a process that science will specify. It is no longer necessary to populate black Africa and Egypt at the beginning of time by mysterious whites or non-Negro races. In the current state of research, the authors, R. A. Nicholas, distinguish three kinds of melanins. 1. Eumelanin or true melanin, black. 2. Pheomelanin or brown, yellow melanin. 3. Allomelanin or other melanins consisting of pigments which vary from brown to yellow. The first two varieties are found chiefly in the animal kingdom, while the latter predominates in the vegetable kingdom. Eumelanin is responsible for the color of the skin and hair. Tyrosine is the precursor of eumelanins. Black pigments are generally formed from the oxidation of diphenols such as dihydroxyphenylalanine, DOPA, 5 to 6 dihydroxyindole, catechol, and 1 to 8 dihydroxynaphthalene, where quinone nuclei are formed with many active centers for polymerization. This is a necessary condition for obtaining a black pigment. Compounds in which the number of active centers is limited produce brown, brown, yellow-brown pigments. The relative insolubility of melanins makes their study delicate as it becomes difficult to purify them. On the other hand, they are of remarkable stability and melanin has been found on fossil specimens dating back 150 million years. They can be heated to 600 degrees without decomposition. According to R.A. Nicholas, modern methods of physical chemical analysis cannot be used for the study of the structure of melanins. In fact, these absorb both in the ultraviolet and the visible violet without characteristic band. The spectroscopic study by nuclear magnetic resonance is very difficult. The infrared spectrum is irrelevant and the X-ray diffraction spectrum has just shown that the structure is not crystalline. The spectroscopic study by electron spin resonance revealed the free radical property of melanins. The study of degradation products yielded interesting results. The tracer method, which is to mark C14, for example, a precursor like tyrosine, is full of promises. It has already made it possible to follow the formation of melanin in the hair, etc. Among the different pigments that contribute to the formation of skin color, carotene, oxyhemoglobin, reduced hemoglobin, melanin, the latter plays the role of primary racial factor in pigmentation of the skin of different breeds. Special cells called melanocytes are responsible for the formation of melanin in the dermis and especially in the human epidermis. Their number is relatively independent of the breed, but their activity, i.e. the amount of melanin they can make, depends on a racial factor linked to the genetic code. In other words, the Negro has the same number of melanocytes as white and albino for a given region of the skin, but its cells being much more active will produce more grains of melanin than those of white due to the activity of tyrosinase, an enzyme which controls the formation of melanin. The melanocytes are found in the Malpighi layer of the epidermis, 1035 per mm2 in the Negro. 
It appears that there is no qualitative difference in melanin in passing from one breed to the other, but only in rate variations. The development of melanin generally requires three elements, the substrate, tyrosine or dopa, the enzyme catalyst for the oxidation reaction of the substrate and oxygen. The reaction depends on several factors, temperature, pH, oxidation reduction potential, and presence of enzyme inhibitors such as sulfur-containing reducing functional groups. There is nevertheless a correlation between the size and morphology of the melanocytes and their activity. The protein supporting albino tyrosinases is genetically defective. The gene responsible for albino acts via groups reducing agents. It has been thought that the oxidation of 5 to 6 dihydroxyindole can be inhibited in albino animals by sulfur functional groups, which are present in melanic melanocytes. The hormonal secretion of the pituitary gland promotes the activity of tyrosinase. The paramagnetism of melanins would thus be explained, same electron exchangers. Melanins may have a protective role for organism against oxidation reduction phenomena and trapping of free radicals that could disturb the metabolism of living cells. They could protect the skin from radiation by such mechanism. The measurement of the color of the skin by spectrophotometry was carried out in America as early as 1939 on whites, Japanese, Hindus, mulattoes, and Negroes, the skins of corpses, and the results were conclusive. The transmission grows without rupture from violet to red. Melanin, like other pigments, obeys Beer's law, that is, the logarithm of the transmission is directly proportional to the concentration. The idea that racial differences in color are due solely to variations in the amount of melanin in the epidermis was confirmed by the observations made on dissolved melanin. The racial differences are explained by the quantities of melanin and melanoid, excluding other pigments, carotene and hemoglobin. Ross Aiken Gortner studied the effect of alkalis on melanin and described the conditions for good extraction without decomposition with 0.2% sodium hydroxide. An Austro-American group of researchers has recently stated that the color of the skin depends particularly on the regular distribution of melanotomes, a phenomenon more pronounced in black than in any other breed. Conclusion, it is clear from the foregoing that physical anthropology thus has a method that is both powerful and fine, practicable whenever the animal or human remains to be analyzed include flaps of skins. This method is therefore also applicable to the eight protohistoric race from Egypt studied by Elliot Smith who often harvested pieces of skins. Perhaps one could also re-examine Giuseppe Sergi's brown race, which populated the entire Mediterranean periphery with proto-history and which is complacently identified with the proto-dynastic Egyptian race. This work is an extract from an article originally published in French under the title Pigmentation de Ancients Egyptians. Test par la melanine by Chaikenta Diop. The original source material can be found on Ababatumi Kassa. Note, since this article was published, it has been established that there are devices which can determine a skin melanin index. They make the invasive approach for determining the melanin index of mummies, as indicated here, unnecessary. <laughs>